that are still in the common law, the, the final third uh, point is uh, the one about materiality, how the common law created a duty, what did the duty look like, even if, it, even if it were capable of coming over in the face of detailed legislative regulation, what would that duty look like? And the learning judge's conclusion, which we respectfully submit in the context of uh, an advisory referendum of this kind, must be right, is that materiality would be an absolute essential of any common law uh, duty or, or, or right. <coughs> There's still the problem of how you define that, but leave that on one side, assume it comes over, you've still got to have materiality. And we submit that in order to have anything remotely approaching something which satisfies uh, any such common law requirement, you would need at least two things. You would need certainty or finality in relation to the misconduct. Because unless and until you've got that, you haven't got a basis, a, found, a, a final and sound basis for a finding of misconduct. And uh, my lords will be very well aware uh, that sitting alongside uh, all of this uh, supervisory jurisdiction of the High Court is a statutory scheme allowing those whom the, whom the Electoral Commission investigates and finds wrongdoing in relation to, to appeal. There is a statutory right of appeal. My learned friend gave you the reference earlier on. Paragraph 6, sub 6 of Schedule 19C of the 2004 Act, whichever one it is. And it is correct to say that uh, the County Court in London uh, has recently produced a judgment analysing the nature of that right. I represented the Electoral Commission in those proceedings, but uh, the nature of that right was asserted by vote leave in those proceedings to be both criminal, in the autonomous Strasbourg meaning of that word, uh, and to require a full-blown de novo hearing. And the argument against the Electoral Commission, which was accepted by the learned judge, was that this was, in effect, a, a sui generis type of appeal, with the grounds of appeal specified in paragraph 6.6. .6. And those grounds of appeal, in terms, include challenges to both law and fact. So although it is uh, uh, in the nature of a review slash an appeal, the actual statutory jurisdiction for that appeal is law and fact and the unreasonableness of the amount imposed by way of civil penalty for, for, for relevant purposes. But so there is a, in terms of uh, assessing the certainty or finality of that misconduct aspect of it, that the court will now be aware that there is a basis provided for in statute, a bespoke basis, for challenging, in effect, the findings of the Commission, both of principle and of fact. And it is that jurisdiction, with that breadth to it, it is that jurisdiction which led the judicial review, the parallel judicial review proceedings brought by vote leave against the Electoral Commission, to be very, very narrow in scope. It started off being a kind of super scattergun parallel attack on everything, and then they realized that actually there was a, <laughs> an unanswerable alternative remedy point. And so in the end, that became a challenge to the publication, the varies, the power in the Electoral Commission to publish the report. The argument for vote leave being there was no power in the Electoral Commission to publish its, its findings. And it was that judicial review that had permission refused on the papers they then renewed orally in front of Mr Justice Swift, refused permission orally on that challenge, and they're now trying to go to the Court of Appeal. But it's on that narrow point about publication. And the reason it's on that narrow point about publication in Faris is because that is the only point which isn't, as it were, subsumed in the, in the challenge to the substantive findings made by the Commission on Fact and Law, which is existing in the County Court. So that's rather a roundabout way of saying there are lots of things that are still going on. I mean, a force your eye for all the other processes, police investigation and all of that, but focusing purely on the Electoral Commission, even in relation to their, their findings, as it were, that you've got a process which is ongoing. 
So that's the first thing that you will require, certainty and finality in order to make good materiality of the actual finding of misconduct. True it is, Madame Femme repeatedly emphasised that the Electoral Commission operate a criminal standard of proof which they have to be satisfied with semantic, but the point is that there's still a process which is ongoing in terms of the statutorily provided right of appeal. Second, um, there is basically now no real argument uh, 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 that the referendum result would have been or would have been likely to have been any different if the unfinalised findings of misconduct are eventually confirmed on appeal. And it's at that point that the Howard report, for obvious reasons, became relevant. And you saw what Mr Justice Usley had to say about that, submitted extraordinarily late, application to admit it not even pursued, uh, and a fundamentally, put the word politely, a fundamentally unfortunate report in its content in any event, inter alia for the reasons that he gave. In any event, that, that's all gone. That's all gone. But what it leaves you with is an assessment of the remaining arguments of principle on the basis that there is nothing to suggest no, that. that the misconduct would have led or would have been likely to lead to any different result. Yes. That's the, that's the short point. So I don't, I, I mean, as a chunk we could go through about why the report is not the greatest thing on the planet, but there's no need because my Lord says it's gone. But the, 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 I should make it clear, we haven't withdrawn our application in relation to that report. My submission was that we had not made the application at the Commission hearing considered it to be something for a full hearing and should be put in the Commission. Yes, but, but, but you don't rely upon it as a reason why Mr Justice Hughes's um, judgment is wrong. No, but what we do not say uh, is that there is no uh, basis for saying that the result would have been different. But the only basis is Professor Howard's report, which, which has gone. You don't rely upon it. You don't re rely upon it now. As I understand it. Well, I'll, perhaps I should deal with it in the end. I will take up my time. It's quite important you deal with it now. It's, it's, no it's, it's quite it. important that we, we know one way or the other because um, if, if you do rely upon it, um, uh, Sir James may have something to say about it. But our position is that the illegalities uh, are uh, so serious and profound that prima facie they are likely to have had an impact on the result of applying the test uh, in. Uh, the RPA uh, section 164. Um, so we, we do say that they are likely to have had a result, an effect. Uh, at the full hearing, we would submit evidence to support that. But our position is that prima facie, yes, uh, this level of overspend in the last week on Facebook ads, etc., is likely to have happened. Well, in which case, I'll take it very, very shortly. Uh, I'm sorry. Just was to be clear. Yes. To, to what reliance at this hearing are you making specifically in relation to the uh, report? You understood it to be none. No, we are not, because we haven't applied to admit that report yet. Uh, but we do, we will rely on that report. For, for our purposes. For, for, our, for the purposes of this hearing. We should have no regard to it. No, our submission is that prima facie, uh, on what one sees from the Electoral Commission findings themselves, uh, there is likely to have been an impact. I understand that. <coughs> what evidential basis um, are you relying upon um, in, in respect of the assertion that um, the breaches, um, had they not occurred, um, the result would have been different. So What's the evidential basis eight, for that? An 8% overspend is the evidence. Uh, in a in a uh, Facebook ad situation where a 600,000 vote difference would have changed the result. And that is a vote change of 2%, I believe. So that is the prima facie evidence from the Electoral Commission. Uh, 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 and and, and that's, that's it? That's the evidential basis? You would that is, and, that, and the evidence that we were then submitted a full hearing uh, would be the evidence <coughs> of uh, Professor Howard. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. 
Well, I'll take it very shortly just in case it's being relied on. It's not entirely sure whether it is or it isn't, but just in case it is, you will have seen the trenchant criticisms uh, that were made by uh, the judge uh, in, in the judgment about the nature and content of that report. Um, and it, on any reading of it, it builds speculation upon speculation. It starts uh, from um, uh, uh, um, unsupported uh, premises about what the methodology should be in tracking between, and this is the very purpose of putting it in, in tracking between the overspend and the actual result. And it seeks to do that set of steps. And the fundamental methodological flaw with it is that it seeks to do that set of steps by going uh, 80 million people, it was originally how it was, the erratum now says it impressions, which if I understood it correctly means pops up on the screen. Facebook uses that. That, that's maybe more, rather more familiar than not, but you've still got to click on it to get there. It just means it floats in front of your face. So 80 million is the starting point, whether it's people or impressions. And then he says, well, 10% of people before whom it was dangled will have clicked, and 10% of those will have believed it, and so on. So you have three lots of 10% on his own methodology. And yet when he comes to the conclusion, he applies two lots of 10%. And the two lots of 10% lead to a number which doesn't work for him because it gives him, it gives him if you did it with three, it would give him 80,000. And if you do it with two of those 10% steps down, you get to a number which overtops the 635,000 or whatever it may be. So it's just fundamentally methodolo methodologically unsound, even on its face. But it, as I say, it starts from the... Uh, uh, it starts from the uh, bizarre starting point of 80 million people, originally it was, and the error doesn't correct, correct or deal with the difficulties found by the learned judge. The 10% three-step sequence, which caused the learned judge to um, produce the statements that he did in his judgment, uh, remains a fundamental problem. And he hasn't explained how calling it impressions rather than people to deal with the obvious absurdity of it being 80 million people, there not being that number in the country, how simply converting that into impressions alters that, because you've still got to click on them as the, as the first of those 10% stages, as it were. So you've still got a three-stage process, and he still can't explain away how the number could possibly be 800,000, which is the number he needs, rather than 80,000. So we respectfully submit that if and to the extent, and it doesn't sound as though it's really being relied upon to any great extent, but even to the extent that he did, there has been no sensible or concerted challenge or answer to the points that the learned judge made on the substance of that report, and therefore that is the premise for the argument of principle that uh, then follows, namely, what is the, um, uh, uh, that th that argument needs to be addressed on the basis that there is no materiality to these uh, pieces of misconduct, even were they to be finalised, which is the first point. So that's what we say about that. That's about the duty. Then the second way in which I said at the outset the claim for duty or right could be put is that this was really only the only rational option at some point in history for the Prime Minister became, in effect, to withdraw the notice. And we respectfully submit that that is simply uh, untenable. Firstly, everyone is and has been very well aware of the misconduct allegations. It's hardly as though the Electoral Commission, just to take that as an example, has been shrouded in secrecy. The fact that their investigation was going on has been known very, very widely and very widely debated. Likewise, with the police investigating other claims and the various other bodies that have been considering the matter. And that's the starting point. It renders utterly hopeless the suggestion, which appears to be made at a slightly later stage of the argument, there was in some way, shape, or form an error of fact. The error of fact being that the Prime Minister is said to have proceeded on the basis that there were no such allegations or there had been no such developments. There's simply no sensible basis for that. Secondly, both the fact and extent and also possible effects of such misconduct, if and to the extent it occurred, 
is at the very best for them uncertain. And that's fatal to the single rational course argument for obvious reasons. In order for there to be a single rational option, namely to withdraw the notice, there would have to be, at the very least, certainty and finality of misconduct and materiality. So both of the things I identified a moment ago. And in any event, thirdly, even if you could get close to all of that, that still does not lead to a single rational option. And the obvious reason why it doesn't lead to a single rational option, to take but one, is that events have moved many miles on since the notice was given. Parliament's legislated in 2017, 2018. There's been enormous parliamentary debate and upheaval, of which my Lords will need no reminding. The process of negotiation has been proceeding for two years. And Parliament is still actively seized of the issue, now merely 40 days away from the, um, from the end of that two-year period. And it would be a perfectly rational position to say, well, Parliament has had this whole set of issues under its eye, and it would be utterly inappropriate to revoke the notice now, given those real developments and that real parliamentary and executive grappling with the set of issues surrounding the withdrawal from the EU. And that is perhaps all the more so, it might be thought, in which A, there is no materiality demonstrated or existing, and B, in which the appropriate bodies are considering all those allegations of wrongdoing. Take the Electoral Commission. They were put in, they considered it, in a variety of different ways. There are statutory appeals from that that are still ongoing. The police are involved there considering some other allegations. No one is proceeding on the basis that those allegations do not exist or that misconduct may not have occurred or that that misconduct may not have been very serious. You've read the Electoral Commission report. There was serious overspend, but that isn't the point. So that's what we say about no uh, rational option. Uh, then my learned friend says, uh, well, uh, oh, I should perhaps, before going on to it wasn't considered, I should perhaps pick up the now reformulated basis for the declaration. I say reformulated on the basis that it's in effect been and continues to be reformulated uh, on the hoof and, I note, whilst maintaining quashing both of which are perhaps surprising and unfortunate. But anyway, the way in which the declaration ultimately appeared to arrive this morning was that it was a declaration that, it, that the, um, uh, the matters found by the Electoral Commission, or no, perhaps more accurately, that there had been illegal and corrupt activity of a sort that would have avoided an election of a binding kind. I hope I've got that just about right, but there's the consequence, the tailpiece that my Lord suggested attached to that. So that in effect breaks down into two parts. A declaration that there's been illegal and corrupt activity, and then the consequence. And if I take the first part of that first, in other words, that declaration that has been illegal and corrupt activity, the obvious point which led my Lord, I think, to suggest that the second part was needed as well, was that it at its very highest, that would be a totally pointless declaration. Because to the extent that it is, and it was solely appeared to be founded upon the findings of the Electoral Commission, those findings have been made public and the reasons for them explained. So even at its highest, point one, on that first part, it would be pointless. Point two, it would be thoroughly inappropriate in any event. And it would be thoroughly inappropriate in any event precisely because the process is still ongoing. The Electoral Commission findings and report are but a point in the stream, and we know that the stream has already arrived at the doors of the county court. And so you've got the twin points under this second answer to the first half of the declaration. Not, there hasn't been finality, 
and moreover, the correct place to see whether there should be finality in terms of a published finding of misconduct is the county court, because that is the place that Parliament has decided is the appropriate appellate court on points of fact and law. So that's the first part of the declaration and why that reformulated thing would be inappropriate. The consequence and the tailpiece, the second half, so that the referendum would have been avoided if it had been a binding election. Um, uh, uh, perhaps two or three points in relation to that. Uh, firstly, my learned friend simply can't get uh, to a place where there is a common law right or there would be a common law right to that. And she can't get to that place because she positively accepts that the RPAs and the legislation which now governs occupies the field. So that the question of illegal and corrupt activity leads to consequences that are subtle and distinct in the way the learned judge pointed out in paragraph 12, depending upon who's doing the illegal activity. But so even on her own argument, it is not enough to say illegal and corrupt, therefore void, because the common law has been supplanted in the binding election concept by the, by the legislation which occupies the field. So, so that is no answer. And I made the submission earlier on that you can't, well, what you can't do is to say the common law used to look like that. It's been supplanted by the representation of the people acting in that context. Now I move to a wholly different context and I drag back in the now supplanted common law developed in the different context and in relation to rights devotion and all of that and in relation fundamentally to binding elections. You can't then bypass the fact. But so she can't get to that place uh, uh, e even on her own argument because she accepts that the RPAs have dealt with the consequences. Secondly, there is not and has never been a common law right to upset elections, my Lord's point. Thirdly, any such declaration, when put together, would be at the very best, hypothetical, and most likely thoroughly misleading. Hypothetical because it is a declaration that if the context was entirely other than it actually is, there would be a legal consequence. And the legal consequence is wrong anyway, but it's hypothetical for that reason. We're here dealing with advisory, and you see immediately the vice of that sort of declaration the vice of it is that it would suggest to the public and to Parliament, and my learned friend's uh, 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 fundamental driver for this is to try and inform parliamentary debate, but it would suggest that in some way, shape or form, that, that inaccurate statement of the law in relation to binding elections is relevant to the situation that applies to the advisory referendum followed by the notice after the 2017 Act of Parliament, and it isn't. So we respectfully submit that there are uh, fundamental objections, both of practice and principle, with that declaration, and it simply doesn't work to try and recast it, and it may be that some of those difficulties with the position um, uh, 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 arise because it doesn't look as though it was a terribly thought-through option in terms of declaratory relief. Certainly it bore no relation whatever to the declaratory relief originally sought in the grounds, which at least one could understand in terms of consequence. So that's what we say about the reformulated version of the declaration. Uh, then my learned friend makes a collection of points um, uh, uh, which effectively assert that, that the uh, consideration, or either there had been no consideration by the Prime Minister of things that needed as a matter of law to be considered, or, or and or that uh, such consideration as there had been was based on error, or, or and or that um, uh, uh, the Prime Minister had in effect ignored a series of relevant developments. 
so far as error is concerned, if I can just take that as a category first, um, so far as er er error is concerned, the starting point for this whole collection of grounds is that the notice and the referendum stand at this point. So it's no longer disappearing. The, ref the notice isn't quashed, the referendum isn't quashed, and yet it is said there's a public law duty or a public law error that's been committed in this way. But that's the premise. And the learned judge was evidently correctly and well alive to that issue. So far as the errors that are asserted are concerned, the judgment deals with those in substance between paragraphs 69 and 72. It is suggested that the Prime Minister was proceeding and appears to have been proceeding on the basis that the result of the referendum is in some way legally binding. It obviously isn't. Everyone knows that it's advisory. And the idea that the Prime Minister, who was the Prime Minister during the Miller litigation, <laughs> was under any illusions that this uh, 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 um, uh, could be taken to be a legally binding referendum is, I respectfully submit, untenable. The fact of the matter is that it was an advisory referendum, as everyone knows, as the Supreme Court made abundantly clear in Miller, and as the Prime Minister and the rest of the executive are entirely aware. But wasn't, wasn't the submission uh, really that um, the referendum was in practice binding because of the manifesto? Uh, well, there would be nothing so wrong. Ms. Ms. Sorry, sort of yeah. link the two things together. She said yeah. that the, the notification, the decision to notify, had been made on the basis of two proposition on on the, on the basis of two factors. One was the referendum. Uh, and secondly, there was the manifesto commitment to honour the referendum. Yes, um, and nothing wrong with that, it might be thought. <laughs> no, so, so, so not, that does, doesn't make the referendum legally binding. No. Um, it, it makes it... Um, it makes it a highly relevant consideration in deciding whether or not to exercise the discretion which Parliament conferred in yes. 2017. Yes. And we assert that there's nothing wrong with that. And the rock upon which any suggestion that there is something wrong with that founders is, again, materiality. Unless there is a materiality argument that actually works. And at this point, we're not dealing with duties. We're dealing with rational consideration of yeah. how things work. You can't exclude materiality from that game. What my learned friend did was to try and exclude it from the duty game and then didn't quite come back to it here. But here, it's a question of whether that can sensibly be regarded as... A rational thing and obviously it can't unless you can demonstrate that as a result of the defalcation of which everyone was aware those um uh, the, the result might have been different yeah. and if there's no basis for supposing that and you've got no materiality this dies and the prime minister is perfectly entitled it would be very 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 surprising indeed if if she were to reach any other conclusion and so the truth of it is that what has actually happened is that entirely appropriately a series of properly identified, by which I mean within the statutory <coughs> scheme that governs these things, bodies are looking at aspects of allegations of misconduct in relation to the referendum. The Electoral Commission has its remit, the police have their remit, no doubt the ICO has her remit, and, and they are looking at these matters, as everyone knows and as is public knowledge. But none of them so far have reached finality, and none of them suggest that there is materiality in the sense that it might have led or was likely to have led to an alteration of result. And so we do respectfully agree with the repeated questioning uh, put to my learned friend about, well, even if material, do you say that? Even if material, so on. I mean, and as I say, the, the, the forensic uh, move was to run that in relation, run something much harder edged in relation to the duty and then forget about it when you get to this bit. But on this bit, it's just a question of rational judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's what, we, uh, that's what we say about that. And there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, treating it uh, politically as a mandate, as it were. Uh, there's the commitment. Has the commitment been undermined in some way? Um, we're on a bound to give, or we're bound to give agreement to, 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 to progress the will of the people. 
in, in legal terms, what he's actually doing is to give effect to the will of Parliament, which perfectly plainly authorised it, whatever Webster may say, perfectly plainly authorised it, knowing what was coming. If there had been a serious question as to materiality or causality of, of, of the, the result, one, one would have expected the Electoral Commission to have, to have raised, raised that. Raised that. Yeah. I mean, it, may, it, may, it may be said in fairness that that's beyond their remit. What they're actually doing is to find whether, the facts. yeah, and whether whether effectively civil offences, and they're called offences in the Act, have been committed. So it's a narrow remit rather than an eyes up remit. I'm not sure you'd necessarily have expected the Commission to do that. But if there was materiality, one could at least see a stronger case for saying, well, that's something that really ought to have been thought about to see. And at that point, no doubt. And this is perhaps the other thing to bear in mind in relation to this aspect of rationality. The world has moved on. And I think my learned friend was very close to getting to that point in her submissions, and rightly so. Because if you put that, I mean, to some extent, rationality and relief, as it were, all fade into each other. And the fact of the matter is, we are where we are. There is an air of unreality about appearing in this court now, as it were, and saying 40 days from the end of it of the two-year period, is it really realistic to suggest, with all the parliamentary developments, that someone should now be going back, whether the Prime Minister on a revisitation or this court on relief, and saying we're going to withdraw the Article 50 notice. I respectfully submit there's a degree of unreality about that. Where Parliament has moved in. Where Parliament has moved in. And is seized. And is debating with all the controversies associated with that. So whatever options the executive might have had before, they're rather more limited now that Parliament has, has moved into that arena. Rather more limited, and on any rational decision-making as of today, or as of yesterday, or as of three months ago, or as of six months ago, you would be taking into account those parliamentary developments. Um, and if Parliament had wanted to say, off you go and withdraw the... Article 50 notice, there might have been all sorts of debate about royal prerogative versus parliamentary democracy, but that's not for now. The fact of the matter is that it's, 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 it's there. But the fundamental and short point in relation to all of this is that once materiality is gone, this point is effectively dead. So as I say, the true position is that the Prime Minister is entirely well aware of the notorious facts, I think it might be all just as having gained a description of them, of the well-publicised facts, Electoral Commission findings, fact of an appeal, police investigations, ICO, DCMS committees, all clear, publicly done and properly done. And it's perfectly obvious that the Prime Minister has decided to, to carry on. And that Parliament is proceeding and everyone is proceeding on that basis. That was the point that Mr Justice Usley was making in, I think it was paragraph 75 of the judgment. <coughs> so in the end, what my learned friend really has is a, is a, is a, a dilemma um, upon which her submissions spin. And it's a dilemma because what she truly wants is a remedy that actually advances the position that her clients espouse. That's why a revisitation of the relief originally sought is quite revealing. Because the true thing that she's really after is a quashing of the notice, the withdrawal of Article 50, the derailing of the process, and or something that deals with the referendum in a thoroughly attacking sort of way. And yet the problem is that she's prepared to wound on that front, but afraid to strike, because the legal arguments don't, make, don't take her there, and can't take her there. And in the end, this is ultimately a political claim a claim which is fundamentally designed to further political aims, and viewed as such, 
it has the double vice of not merely being political, but political in a sphere in which Parliament is already thoroughly engaged. That's all I want to say about the merits. And on timing, I can be very short indeed, if I may, unless my Lords have further questions for me on the merits. No, thank you very much. So far as timing is concerned, we respectfully submit that the, that the, the, the learned judge analysed the timing issues with conspicuous care and at considerable length and was right for the reasons that he gave. Uh, three points shortly, perhaps, uh, 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 and then I'll sweep up a couple of things that my learned friend says. Firstly, the correct analysis is that the grounds arise when the illegality alleged occurs. And so it is the referendum, or at the very latest, and paragraph 60 of the judgment said it would have made no difference if it had been this, the date of the notice. The judge was also obviously right that the core of this claim, as he put it, is a claim that has to attack and vitiate, to use that word, i.e. fundamentally attack, undermine, render unlawful, render void, that's what vitiate means, the, refer the, the referendum, and all the, on the back of it, the notice. So this is a question about extension of time. Secondly, given that that is so, there is a question about the public interest, good administration, and all of that. And there is here the most obvious and pressing need for any such challenge to be brought with the greatest possible speed. We don't rely upon the, uh, 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 the bits and pieces that say six weeks for challenges of the ki kind that are permitted by the 2015 Act directly, but we do rely upon that, as a, uh, in this sense, but we do rely upon that as at least an indication that Parliament itself is thoroughly well alive to the need to get on with things and to bring challenges timiously in this sort of context. And the potential prejudice to good administration of extending time here would be very great for all of the reasons that the judge gave. Because of all the things that have had to go on and that have gone on since the Article 50 notice was given. And those matters are summarised fairly properly and on the basis that the learned judge was entitled to adopt at paragraphs 52 and 53 of the judgment. The third point is that it is plain that the claimants did not bring the claim with the greatest possible speed applying those principles. Uh, the evidence makes entirely clear, and again the judge dealt with these dates uh, very carefully in his judgment, but it makes entirely clear that these allegations have been in the public domain for a very long time. Press reports from way back in 2016, investigations of a serious kind in April 17 in relation to leave.eu, vote leave reactivated in November 17, parliamentary debates in March, and then the reports of the Electoral Commission starting in May effectively. So again, no basis for challenging the learned judges setting out of the facts. And really, on timing, my learned friend effectively says, well, we had to wait for the Electoral Commission. And until the Electoral Commission reported, there wasn't a basis for going in a judicial review. But as you've seen, her case relies in truth, not simply upon the Electoral Commission, but, but upon a whole gamut of allegations of misconduct in relation to the referendum, some of which are still in the very early stages, like the police investigation. And it is said that all of those needed to be taken into account on the substance, that's what's said, and weren't. That's an inaccurate allegation, but uh, that shows you the span of um, uh, allegations in terms of timing. And if it is said, well, the Electoral Commission findings were the first concrete findings of misconduct, that doesn't help her. And it doesn't help her because a, a, such a plea would acknowledge the need for at least such findings, so all the rest of the grounds of challenge, which are 
entirely unfinal and uncertain drop away. And if you want those other allegations, they're collectively, uh, they're grouped together in the judgment at 28.32. But the key point here anyway, I keep making it, but I'll make it very shortly, is that the findings of the Electoral Commission are not yet final anyway. They're merely part of a process that is wending its way through the courts with the appeal to the county court, the JR, to the Court of Appeal, and so on. And so the learned judge was right, we respectfully submit, to reject that case, i.e., had to wait, could they wait for the Electoral Commission, see paragraphs 57 and 58 of the judgment dealing with that specific point. And in relation to, well, it's a continuing decision, the second real line of argument my learned friend seeks to deploy in relation to timing, I, I have nothing to add to, but respectfully submit uh, uh, that paragraph 61, 61 to 63 of the judgment are a proper and complete answer to that. The answer in very brief summary given by the judge is you can't, as it were, keep creating by way of device grounds for challenge by writing letters saying will you make a decision now, will you make a decision now, make a decision now. Because JR time principles do not operate on that, on that basis for obvious reasons. Finally, on costs, again, we respectfully submit that the, the learned judge's short judgment in relation to this in the transcript that follows the main judgment uh, uh, was one which was entirely open to him. This was obviously an exceptional case, um, and uh, he was, in those circumstances, entitled to make the award that he did. Well, was, those are my submissions. Thank you very much. Very good. Yes. started by putting a case that we have not ever put. Um, we've never sought the question of the referendum um, and we do not uh, seek it now. Nor are we concerned here with any right. Uh, we do not need a right either to be here at court, the claimants have standing, or to make normal and standard administrative law arguments regarding the legality of executive action. In respect of ground one, we seek a declaration as to the law, as we explained uh, in the original pre-action letter and uh, the skeleton. We could have sought such a declaration by part eight proceedings, but in light of the fact that there was also a challenge to the legality of the administrative act, it seems sensible to do so in the administrative court. There is nothing novel about any of this. Ground three equally is a standard public law challenge that the Prime Minister uh, made a decision uh, to notify the EU of the UK's departure uh, on the basis of an error of fact and, and law because she believed uh, and stated that she believed uh, that the referendum produced the democratic will of the people. As I've explained by reference to the case law, democratic has a legal meaning. It means lawful and in accordance with the modalities laid down by Parliament. Ground four is a standard <coughs> Byers argument. Our submission in relation to that is that Parliament cannot have intended to empower the Prime Minister to decide to take the United Kingdom out of the EU uh, and to notify the EU to that effect. Uh, if the, the process itself uh, that had led to the referendum result uh, was unlawful and therefore undemocratic. Therefore, we simply do not understand uh, my friend's contention that the only way we can make our case, and this is how he started his argument, was to show, first he said, that we have a constitutional right to quash the referendum. That in our submission we have never said, 
and is wholly unnecessary for our case. Secondly, he said uh, that we must show there's a single rational option open to the defendant, and that is that she revoke Article 50. Again, something that we have never said and we do not contend. Indeed, uh, we've put various options that the Prime Minister might decide uh, to uh, seek an extension of time uh, for the purposes of holding another vote. Uh, she might decide to have a public inquiry. She might decide to put the question to Parliament. Uh, we, have said, we have never suggested that she must uh, revoke, and nor do we have to establish that uh, to succeed on our claim. Um, <clears throat> so we simply don't understand even the reference to the right to vote cases in this context. The reason, my Lord, I took you to those cases was to show you that the common law has long recognized that the right to vote is more than a right to cast your vote. It is a right to vote in a lawful process. And when that process is not lawful, the common law has held the result right, uh, the, the vote to be void. And I took you to Faulkner. Now, Faulkner is a slightly bizarre case because it's a case about uh, a parish uh, vicar uh, and the, the law was customary law. But the court clearly said if the customary law of process, which all the electorate <coughs> were entitled to, was not abided by, the election was void and that was a right possessed of the entire electorate. And what he said in that case, I believe it was Holt, Justice Holt, said, he said that it, um, you don't need to show whether the result would have been different because you do not know the consequence of the law not having been abided by, the rules not having been complied with. And that strain of case law runs right through to the modern day in the Rahman or Ehrman case uh, that I also took you to. Uh, and as I did submit, it's hardly a surprising proposition. So the target of the case, my lord, is executive decision-making and legality in the standard public law sense. <coughs> my friend said there was no common law right to upset elections. Uh, that is incorrect by reference, again, to the authorities I took you to, uh, both the pre-statutory uh, authorities, Faulkner, Bradford, for example, and then statutory authorities, uh, Morgan and Simpson uh, and Bruckner. Then he said, look, administrative convenience means that really we've got, this is all uh, out of the, uh, under the bridge now, it would be inappropriate to withdraw. <clears throat> well, it's a matter for uh, the Prime Minister whether she considers it inappropriate to withdraw now. That is not something for this court. Um, but it's an extraordinary submission um, to suggest that it's simply too late for the law to be upheld. Nor does it chime with the reality of the situation. We are hardly in a settled place. Uh, we are hardly at a stage where we have reached some kind of agreement uh, and decision even at a parliamentary level. And the delay has not been the claimant's fault. If it is the fault of anybody, it is the fault of the Electoral Commission. And then uh, the further fact that we have been waiting before this court now for over six months uh, to try and have this case heard. We say again, it cannot be administratively convenient to treat an unlawful referendum as lawful. Uh, and we do not say that this is unreal. We were t told that there was an air of unreality about this. We say, on the contrary, there is an air of very serious reality about this. Uh, time could be extended. Parliament has not moved in to the sphere, and that, that is a very important point. Now, my. Lord asked about the powers of the uh, Parliament in relation to withdrawal under the 2018 Act. 
and the powers that my Lord mentioned are in section 13. We have brought the relevant act it here. Is, it is section 13. Yes, it is section 13. Now, the Withdrawal Act is an act that is there to deal with a no-deal situation. Because what the Withdrawal Act does is it incorporates all EU law on the day of departure. That is, it assumes there is no transition period, which exists in the Withdrawal Agreement. If there is the Withdrawal Agreement, effectively the 1972 Act continues for a further uh, uh, two years. So what the Withdrawal Act does is it says to Parliament, um, you have the process, the very complex process under 13, motions, etc., uh, with the deal. Uh, you can accept this deal, in which case we need a withdrawal and implementation act prior to ratification. That's provided in Section 13. And it is that act that would effectively continue the 72 Act, and the Withdrawal Act would go into abeyance. Or alternatively, you can uh, not agree the deal, in which case the Withdrawal Act comes into force, we have no deal. So it is no deal or deal. Uh, and then there is all this motion stuff. But what has been going on in Parliament over the last uh, couple of months is various attempts by uh, different MPs, uh, including um, uh, the Honourable Mr. Grieve, to take control of, of the process in some way. <laughs> Why the 2018 Act was, was raised was because, like the 2017 Act from Miller, um, it, it, it enforces the point that the Parliament is in charge of this. No, my Lord. So, at the moment, uh, the Executive remains wholly in charge of the Article 50 process. Uh, and this uh, is because... What do you mean by that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain. Um, so, under the Article 50 process, uh, the... Prime Minister has power, for example, to seek an extension of time. That is one of the things she could do. Um, and indeed, in the Withdrawal Act, the 2018 Withdrawal Act in Section 22, the Prime Minister, uh, the, it's the Secretary of State for Exiting the EU, uh, can change the withdrawal date by way of order. Yes. So that enables her, for example, to seek an extension of time. Now, that all operates... Um, quite apart from uh, the, withdrawal, the, the Withdrawal Act in relation to the 72 Act, which is a separate thing. The Article 50 process is entirely within the control of the executive. And that is what we're concerned with before this court. Um, a further point on, on the 2017 Act. My friend repeatedly said that under Section 1 of the no, uh, Notification Act, Parliament authorised um, the Prime Minister to withdraw the United Kingdom. Now, that is an incorrect uh, use of language. What it did was it empowered her to take the decision as to whether to leave and then as to when to notify and that is made uh, absolutely clear in the decision of the Divisional Court in Webster, paragraph 15, which is in your authorities. <coughs> and it was apparently cited with approval in the Court of Appeal decision, which re refused permission in that case. And it's been set out in the House of Commons briefing paper. So the 2017 Act did not authorise the, the removal of the United Kingdom from the European Union. It empowered the Prime Minister to take that decision herself, and that is why we are before this court, because it is her executive decision-making power that we're concerned with. So turning then to reasonableness, um, the first point to make is the reasonableness challenge stands irrespective of the position as to corrupt and illegal practices, void, voidable, uh, material effect. Because our submission on reasonableness is that having regard to what she knows now, uh, and I'm talking about the entire scope, so the uh, findings of the Electoral Commission, 
the referral to the NCA and the Metropolitan Police, the DCMS report, the ICO fine of leave.eu of 120,000, the ICO investigation into Facebook, the ICO investigation into vote leave. Looking at that all in the round, it is wholly unreasonable for the Prime Minister to continue on the basis that the uh, referendum uh, was lawful, or more importantly, uh, that in, it actually expressed the will of the people. And taking that at, at a pure reasonableness level. And that is why we don't in any sense need to show that we have a right to void the result or that the result could be voided. Because we say that there is sufficient doubt, significant doubt, as to the legitimacy of the process. And the doubt is so significant, having regard to all the factors I've raised, that it is no longer reasonable to soldier on uh, without any regard to those factors. The second point is that we say that's particularly so, or it's another way of looking at it, or a separate argument, um, that in the context of a binding referendum, we say uh, the result would have been voided. So we say it's, they are two different factors, and they stand alone. Um, or together. Now, my friend's submission leads inexorably to the conclusion that even if there was full-blown uh, voter fraud or something numerical, uh, it would still be not. It would still be reasonable and unchallengeable to continue. Because, as I understood it, he said we, uh, the court had, the the parliament had effectively uh, not given any route to go to the court to challenge it. And we say that 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 is not right. As to the argument that um, the result, he says there's no argument that the result would have been different. Um, well. First of all, we say that we rely as our primary argument on um, Rahman 33, uh, that actually it's not necessary in the context of this kind of uh, illegality. So what's, what's the reference? Um, it's, it's paragraph 33 of the Erlam or Rahman case. I did take you to it. Tab 16. So an important feature of this ground for avoiding an election is that the petitioner does not have to prove that the corrupt or illegal practices were likely to have affected the result of the election. We have proved that the practice by the candidate And again, that goes back to the Lord Denning test in Morgan and Simpson. Yes. I mean, this is the statutory test. Yes. yes. Um, the secondary, now he's, he says we have to meet a materiality test. We don't know why he says that, because he hasn't explained why he thinks materiality is the test. Um, but in any event, the materiality test is whether it may reasonably be supposed to have had an effect. Uh, and we submit uh, that that uh, is certainly met for the purposes of arguability. It is, in any event, one argument in, in the context of, uh, of, of two. And um, the first is obviously met. The second, we say, is uh, at the very least arguable. Um, in relation to ground three, my friend says that uh, we 
um, have pr ground three is the error of fact claim that the prime minister proceeded on the basis of an error of fact when she considered uh, that there was democratic will of the people. He says that we are proceeding on the basis that no allegations of illegality were known to the prime minister when she notified. Uh, well, that is not our claim. But in fact, there were no allegations at the time. I told you the dates. On the 21st of March 2017, the Electoral Commission closed its investigation into vote leave, and it was only in April 2017 that it opened an investigation into leave.eu. So there might have been allegations flying around the place, but uh, certainly there were no investigations open. But in any event, that's not our claim. Our claim is not that she triggered uh, on the basis that there were no allegations. Our claim is that she proceeded on the basis that the process had been lawful. And we would be very surprised if the Prime Minister were to say that was not correct and that she, in fact, was proceeding on the basis that the process had not been lawful. Now, just finally, to turn to the consequences of um, Mr. Eady's submissions, the Prime Minister has rendered the advice binding by virtue of her decision to treat it as binding. Therefore, she cannot say that the rules of legality, democracy, do not apply to the referendum, or that she doesn't care about those rules. Mr. Reedy says it's simply not possible for any of this to be considered. Uh, there's no legal right for it to be considered, no court can look at it, and she can do what she likes, including not consider any of this. Uh, well, our submission, and that would be an extraordinary state of affairs, uh, and, and it couldn't be right. Uh, and it's not justified uh, by anything in the statute. There is absolutely no exclusion by the 2015 Act, the jurisdiction of the court. And as I said in my submissions, <coughs> had there been, uh, it would be surprising uh, if the court uh, were not willing, to some extent at least, or at least in some context, uh, now that we have reached a, a state of constitutionality in our uh, public law, uh, to uh, rule that certain exclusions of the jurisdiction of the court are themselves not lawful, even having a parliamentary sovereignty. But we are not there. We have neither an express exclusion of the common law uh, nor an implicit, and we certainly have no jurisdiction exclusion of the jurisdiction of the courts. And we are here uh, asking the court to give normal administrative law remedies 